So in Singapore, we actually have um, what we call the Declaration for Religious Harmony. Uh, it has been um, put together by different religious groups, clans, and so forth. And if you realize, 2003 is two years after 9-11, when the government here in Singapore realized the importance, really, of pulling the different religions to take a look at religious um, relations over here. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Yo. <laughs> it's, it's as important as your, uh, our pledge. Okay? But this, you'll notice that it is for people in Singapore. It is not just for Singapore citizens. Okay? So it says that we, the people in Singapore, Declare that religious harmony is vital for peace, progress, and prosperity in a multiracial and multi religious nation. We resolve to strengthen religious harmony through mutual tolerance, confidence, respect, and understanding. We shall always recognize the secular nature of our state, promote cohesion within our society respect each other's freedom of religion, grow our common space while respecting our diversity, foster interreligious communications, and thereby ensure that religion will not be abused to create conflict and disharmony in Singapore. And in um, July, in July, there was uh, the International Conference on Cohesive Society that was called by our president, um, Madam Halima Yaakob, right? And uh, MCCY actually further developed this particular, de uh, particular declaration and called for an extended one, which um, I didn't put it out, but it is really a commitment to safeguard religious harmony here in Singapore. So there, there is a further elaboration on this point. So what does the church say about um, interreligious dialogue? Now, this particular one on uh, all are called to be the new people of God is actually from the document on the church. All right? It's from the constitution of the church. And it says that all are the new people of God and all belong to the kingdom. Right? We're not just talking about the church here on earth. We are talking about the heavenly kingdom. So in Lumen Gentium, we are reminded that we are all called to this Catholic unity. And while we belong to the Catholic Church, not all of us are Catholic. Unless if your heart is open to embrace, your heart is universal, can you really call yourself a Catholic? Because the church recognizes that the Catholic unity, it does not only embrace the Catholic faithful like you and me, catechumens, baptized Christians, but even the people of the Testament and Promises. These are the Jews. Okay? They belong also to this Catholic unity. Then, of course, there are also the Muslims who profess the faith of Abraham, those who seek the unknown God. You know, people who are a bit more scrupulous, they're not sure whether there is a God that they really subscribe to, so they seek the unknown God, just in case, right? then there are those who do not know the gospel of Christ nor his church, yet sincerely seek God to do 
his will through their conscience. Okay, they are also called to this Catholic unity. Those who have no explicit knowledge of God but strive to lead a good life. So you notice really what it means to be Catholic and how all em embracing is this Catholicity. You know, it is not just a single group of people. Everyone called to be in this world actually belongs to this Catholic unity. <coughs> so just a brief mention about uh, ecumenical dialogue, or what we call intra-dialogue. Usually when we refer to ecumenical dialogue, it is really a dialogue among Christians. And brothers and sisters, if people ask how many are Christians, and if you are there, please do not say, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> you know? Because all of us are Christians. And sometimes the Catholics will say, you see, but my Christian brothers and sisters don't want to dialogue with me. I say, our fault, lah, because we say we are not Christians, so they find that there's nothing in common to dialogue, right? So, ecumenical dialogue, dialogue with the world. Then the interreligious dialogue is really a dialogue with people of different other religions, other than the Christians. So, um, in the Pontifical Council, for example, the sub-branch uh, that we have is the uh, dialogue with the Jews and the Muslims. And of course, there are the other officers um, that we're in dialogue with. So I was actually in charge of a dialogue with Muslims in Asia and then the other uh, Asian Oriental religions, including the uh, indigenous So why do we inter uh, why do we do interreligious dialogue? Now remember that these are church teachings, huh? The church recognizes that the Holy Spirit is present in other religion. Okay? It is the spirit that makes present God's work in Christ in the lives of all people. So the spirit does not just work within the Christian community or the Catholic Church. The Holy Spirit is at work in the history of peoples, in all cultures and religions to bring about good. And if you have studied, for example, history, you notice that throughout the history of humanity, one of the things that they will always discover whenever they find the presence of civilization is religion because people will always feel that they need to connect with the divine. Okay? Then those who obey the promptings of the Spirit are already on the path of salvation. Then, of course, behind in your mind, you will be wondering, if everyone is safe, why evangelize? Why evangelize? Okay? So keep that question behind in your mind. So the church also says that there's value in uh, other non-Christian scriptures because God uses the scriptures to deepen the followers' relationship with God. And in these scriptures, we find also elements of grace. That means the Spirit is also working in them and through them. God is present to the followers of other religions in many ways. They may not recognize the presence of the Spirit or understand what is this Holy Spirit. Um, there was once when I was uh, with a monk and he had actually... Uh, deepen his studies on uh, the mysteries of the rosaries. 
Okay? And then he wanted to give a talk to Catholics and also his Buddhist followers. He was doing very well when it came to the life of Christ, right? His human life, what he went through. But when it came to the spirit, I think he had problem. Okay? Also partly because, like, for example, for Buddhists, they do not subscribe to a god. And yet this same monk, when he was in Rome, and we were in St. Peter's Basilica, those of you who have been in the Basilica, on the right side as you enter, there is the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. How many of you have been inside there? Okay. So you have this um, uh, adoration that goes on from, I think it was from 8 onwards to 6 in the evening, ongoing. Eh? So when he and his group of followers entered the Basilica, into this chapel, what happened was, it was a change of duty. So the two seats that was right in front of the Blessed Sacrament was empty. This monk actually went right up and knelt on one of the chairs. And he was there for almost 20 minutes. Probably he didn't know what he was worshipping. But I think in his heart, he knew that he was in a sacred presence. And you'll find whenever I see any of his followers, whenever they enter a chapel, first thing that they will do is they will kneel and respectfully offer their uh, sign of respect to the Blessed Sacrament. So God is present, right, in the hearts of these people. So dialogue is found in the very plan of God. And there is no dialogue possible without a thorough understanding of the other. It's not possible to dialogue if your partner, the, the other person standing before you, doesn't know much about his or her faith. And it is the same for us. If we want to enter into dialogue, if we want to be people of dialogue, I must be rooted in my own faith. And the church also reminds us that it is important for us to uphold religious freedom, which also means that Christians have a right, people who find that the church is no longer meaningful and they want to convert, the church is saying, yes, they have a right to this religious freedom. And in the dialogue that we have uh, with our Muslim brothers and sisters, we are trying very hard to say Muslims who want to convert, they have a right because no one can compel them to remain a Muslim. And actually, uh, the privilege really of being in interreligious dialogue, and I have uh, Muslims, uh, brethren who are lawyers, actually telling me, sister, actually Muslim can convert. But usually when we hear that Muslim cannot convert, it is because of families. And I said that we were there before. I have heard of Catholics, people who were Catholics who married, for example, another faith or another Christian denomination. Up to this day, they're still living with that guilt feeling that they have left the church, they are condemned for life. But it's not true. You know, it's not true. The church does accept, right? So freedom of this kind means that all people should be immune from coercion and no one is forced to act according who, to his uh, convictions or to their belief. Okay? The relation of the non-Christian religions, uh, the church stresses the importance of inter-religious dialogue and the church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions, 
All right? We reject nothing. And we exhort Christians. Mother Church exhort Christians while witnessing to our own faith and way of life to acknowledge the spiritual and moral truth found among the non-Christians, also in their social and cultural life. The respect that we have to uh, give to others. Now, the church expect from the various religions answers, no, sorry, the men expect from various religions answers to resolve riddles of the human condition. What is the meaning of our life? What is moral good? What is sin? When is suffering and purpose? What, what does it serve? And we find, for example, even today, people will continue to ask these questions, especially when something happens, you know. Then you say, if there is a God, a God whom we say is loving, how can he allow suffering in this world? Is it God? Or is it ourself? Hmm? Now, the church in Asia must be missionary, and all of us as church must engage in this dialogue with cultures, religions, and the poor. And especially here in Singapore, uh, church in Asia because we are coming from such diverse cult cultures and we do celebrate a lot of these festivals, right? It is good for us really to know the roots and why we celebrate what we celebrate and not just simply follow, okay? And then, of course, the love for the poor, to dialogue with also the poor, the principal elements of this mission, what is important, a uh, document from Dialogue and Mission, our presence and witness. Wherever we are as Christians, as Catholics, we are there always as a presence and a witness of our Lord Jesus Christ. The commitment to social development and human liberation. And you notice the church, through Caritas, through Caris, through many organizations, we continue to serve the people who are most in need. We look at also human development, regardless of race, regardless of religions. The church also teaches the importance of our, sorry, um, our liturgical life, our prayer life, and contemplation. And especially if we are in interreligious dialogue, we have to be people of prayer. We cannot enter into dialogue thinking that as long as I have all the knowledge, I have all the formation, I have the answer for what the church stands for and what I believe. Because when someone throws a question to you, it may not be really asking you about how much you know. It's really about our faith, our relationship with this God whom we believe in, our relationship with one another. Sorry, the uh, principal elements of this mission is also uh, seen in interreligious dialogue proclamation and catechesis. Important is also always to see proclamation and interreligious as intertwined. Proclamation cannot replace dialogue. Dialogue cannot replace proclamation. Both goes hand in hand. It's intertwined, right? The church will always talk about the four forms of dialogue, the dialogue of life, being neighbor to one another, being neighbor to those in need. All right, people whom we meet on the streets or our neighbor or even our family members. And I think in Singapore now, you'll find that there are more and more interreligious families. Okay? The dialogue of actions important to collaborate on 
important projects. And in Singapore, I think the compassion that we have for people overseas, our neighboring countries, you find that we will reach out regardless of whether or not they are Muslim countries or whether they are Buddhist countries. It's because we are from a common humanity. We want to reach out to them. The third form of dialogue is the dialogue of theological exchange. And this deepens to under, uh, it seeks to deepen our understanding of respective religious heritage and appreciate each other's spiritual values. That's what we did this morning. It is more a theological dialogue, even if it is uh, done only very short, you know, but there's much more in it than what we heard. Okay? But it gives you really a, a taste of what it means when we are in theological exchange. Right? Just now at table, for example, and the Muslim um, Mr. Alum, Alum, Alumni, uh, Alumi, yeah, he is actually an ambassador and also. Um, He's with Muis and he was saying, you know, perhaps I think now with our relation, can we, for example, discuss further on Jesus' death on the cross, for example? Because Muslim didn't believe in it, the, the Jews didn't believe in it, right? Are we prepared to go deeper than uh, what we are already engaged in and not always to be stuck on the level of humanity? So it, it's really a challenge for us to say, do we really want to seek understanding with others? So through the dialogue of our religious experience, we also share our spiritual life, right? the spiritual reaches. How do we search for God? And then from another uh, document on dialogue and proclamation, uh, it brings about interpersonal communion, and dialogue as an attitude of respect and friendship. And we need to always inculcate this spirit of dialogue. People who are in dialogue, we have to be very careful that, you know, we have to keep praying that the spirit opens our mind. I cannot be in dialogue one moment and then behind I criticize others, then I'm not a person of dialogue, right? So the spirit of dialogue, whether I'm in or out of dialogue, I must always be very attentive. Then the um, third dialogue, thirdly, that all positive and constructive interreligious relations is directed at mutual understanding and enrichment. And this is really about the evangelizing mission of the church. Okay? So while we dialogue, we are still proclaiming. So what is proclamation? Proclamation is communicating the gospel message, the mystery of salvation realized by God, for all in Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. So we have to know our faith, right? Now this dialogue, this proclamation can be solemn and public. Like what we have today is a public gathering. The people of the other religions were also with us, right? Now proclamation is the foundation, center, and submit of evangelization. So if I say that I'm called to be an evangelizer. I cannot say, I'll just do proclamation. I don't want to do dialogue. It's very troublesome in case I, if I get into trouble. Huh? No, it has to be both. Conversion may refer to a change of religious adherence. But I always say, conversion must keep happening in our life. We must keep praying for conversion in our life. So it's not just about conversion from one religion to another. 
All right? It is really a conversion so that I grow in my relationship with God and with others. So Pope John Paul II says that in interreligious dialogue, we must, it's always a dialogue of salvation. Believe that others are also safe, and we have to be open uh, to open ourselves to God in this dialogue, all right? God is always present. Pope Benedict says that the church wants to continue building bridges of friendship with others. So when I was in Rome, I was actually between... Uh, I was serving at the time of John, uh, John Paul II and Pope Benedict, both popes. Huh? And uh, yeah, he, so he wants to continue to build bridges. And he also mentioned that genuine prayer transforms hearts and opens us to dialogue and understanding and reconciliation. So the only way to um, break down violence, hatred, and revenge it's true dialogue. We need to break down those walls. And uh, in 2006, that is the year when we had the 20th anniversary after the interreligious dialogue of Pope John Paul with the other religions in uh, 1986. So we had a meeting for the young people from different parts of the world. And today, the young people are still meeting uh, each other across different continents. They are picking up the message of uh, Pope Benedict, Benedict very seriously okay, and engaging themselves. Pope Francis, dialogue does not mean giving up your identity as a Christian. In fact, we dialogue because we are Christians. True openness means remaining firm in one's deepest conviction and being open to understanding others. And he said, when people have this ability to listen, all right, they speak softly, tranquilly. Religious people, now religious people are not only the priests, religious, the bishops. Even you, all of you are religious in your heart, all right? So religious people must listen to one another and speak to each other as brothers and sisters. This is the only way whereby we can seek the path together. So evangelizing mission is one reality with many aspects of our life. Prayer and worship, care for the sick and the aged, human promotion, the struggle for justice, interreligious dialogue and the proclamation to others, true dialogue, catechesis and Christian education. So we are reminded in conclusion that it is not just a church in dialogue, but it is a church that is evangelizing. It is not a church that is close in on itself, living in a spiritual ghetto, not interested in living and cooperating with neighbours of other faith. Right? And especially in our context, you know, Malaysia, Singapore, in Asia, basically most of our, our um, places are, what do you call, um, of mixed religions, right? Very few societies in uh, Asia is homogeneous. Maybe Japan, Hong Kong, but even Hong Kong, they have also at least five religions. So genuine dialogue is one that is open and rooted. It is open to embrace the Holy Spirit that is at work in others and rooted both in faith and in her conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we must not fear this call for dialogue when it says that we have to be open, we have to be open to embrace others, to learn from others. And when it says that we have to be rooted, be rooted in our own faith and belief. It's only when I have a belief that I can enter into dialogue. 
Otherwise, we might end up too open without rootedness. We end up being a radical. Everything also can, right? If I am rooted and I'm not open, become a fundamentalist. Okay, so on that note, I leave you with uh, these thoughts on uh, the invitation to all of us to be children of dialogue, of our one brother, Jesus Christ. Thank you.